The title of the paper is Mandatory versus Discretionary Spending, the Status Quo Effect. Uh, this is a theoretical paper uh, trying to understand, to some extent, um, rules that govern budget negotiations. Um, so just to motivate what we do here, um, we think of government budgets decided through uh, negotiations. And in the United States, uh, and in some other countries, some European countries too, uh, two types of spending programs can be agreed to. Uh, what we call discretionary spending programs, where uh, once you have decided on the allocation for the current period, in the next period, if you don't decide on a new allocation, essentially uh, nothing gets spent, uh, versus mandatory spending programs. Uh, and with mandatory spending programs, these uh, programs are written into law. Some good examples are Social Security uh, and Medicare. And once you've written these programs into law, uh, in the current period, in the, in the next period, if you want to change these programs, you need agreement of uh, the legislature or the government. Uh, so that's how we distinguish between mandatory and, uh, and discretionary spending programs, and these are the two main uh, these are the two types of spending programs we consider in this paper. So I should also uh, say, if anyone has any questions at all, uh, please feel free to stop me at any time. Uh, I like to take questions. I don't want there to be any confusion about what it is we're doing. So, so given that's what we're doing, um, in the United States, uh, these uh, categories are actually written into the tax code. And uh, we can actually look at the data on these categories of spending. The red line indicates mandatory spending programs. This is between 1962 and 2010. Um, and the blue line indicates discretionary spending programs. And uh, clearly, uh, the trend for mandatory is increasing. The trend for discretionary is decreasing. This paper is not at all about explaining this trend. Uh, this picture is merely here to say that it would be nice to start understanding uh, the effects of these mandatory programs because clearly they're important drivers of, uh, of the budget. Uh, so the question we're asking is how do mandatory spending programs affect the provision of public goods? Uh, in particular, do they enhance the efficient provision of public goods or not? Uh, and the second question we'll ask is, do parties benefit from the introduction of mandatory programs? Um, and how do we answer this question? We're going to set up a model with two parties that differ in uh, uh, the, the value they place on public goods. Uh, and in this model, these parties will meet each period to, divide, to decide how to divide a budget. And this budget is going to be divided between the public good and private transfers for each party. Uh, how will the uh, budget negotiation process take place? There'll be a randomly selected party that gets to make a proposal for the budget. Uh, that party will make a proposal. And the, uh, the party um, that is not making the proposal will either agree to the proposal or not. And the, uh, and the default rule, if the other party does not agree, will be de determined by the spending program, whether it's a discretionary spending program or it's a mandatory spending program. So I'll give details in a second. Uh, so what are the main results that we'll find? We're going to find that discretionary programs, uh, by and large, result in, uh, they, not by and large, discretionary programs uh, result in under provision of the public good and mandatory programs result in higher provision of the public good. Uh, in some cases, mandatory programs ex ante parade dominate discretionary programs. Uh, this is true when parties are sufficiently patient, when the persistence of power is low, and when political polarization is low. Uh, so we'll find that political polarization, which is the difference these parties, uh, different weights these parties place on the public good, matters quite a bit. Uh, in particular, we're going to find that when polarization is very high, we can get over provision of the public good. That is, provision of the public good higher than the efficient level. Uh, but what we find is that this only occurs in transitory states. So in the high polarization case, in fact, the unique steady state is going to be the efficient uh, level of the public good. Um, so we also find that in steady states, public spending is either below or equal to the efficient level of the public good when polarization is sufficiently low. Uh, but it's always closer to the efficient level 
than under discretionary. So there's a vast list of related literature. Um, uh, I'm not going to go through all of it, but I will just sort of highlight. So it's definitely related to a literature of public good provision um, uh, with political economy frictions. Of course, Dave has some work in this uh, in this area. It's related to Bakaglinian code, to dynamic political economy models. Um, and of course, it's also related to uh, this literature on uh, dynamic bargaining with the endogenous status quo. Um, uh, Jan has some work in this in this area, um, and a number of other people. Um, so I'm not going to go too much into this. So let's get right into the model. And as I said, please stop me if anything is unclear. I know um, <clears throat> there was a, a very enjoyable evening last night, and uh, <laughs> some of us may not be as sharp as we'd like to be right now, including myself. So uh, let's get into it. So we've got two parties. So we call them H and L. Time is infinite and discrete. Uh, the budget is, oops, budget is given by BT, uh, and BT is an allocation to the public good GT, uh, a transfer for party H, uh, XTH, and a transfer for party L, XTL. Uh, the feasible budget, we're going to just assume it's a dollar that arrives every period exogenously. So this budget needs to sum to uh, no more than one. Uh, so each party receives a utility in period T uh, for their transfer, XIT, plus theta I is the weight they place on the public good, and uh, that's multiplied by log GT. Uh, so theta I, as I said, is the relative weight party I places on the public good, and we're going to assume that theta L is less than theta H. And the two together sum to something less than one, which gives us that the, level, the efficient level of the public good is always, uh, we can always provide it. <coughs> uh, so the parties will maximize their expected discounted uh, stream of utilities uh, from the budgets. So uh, right away, we can uh, think about the benchmark, the efficient level of the public good in this setting. Uh, and so we'll, look, we'll define the Pareto efficient allocation, which solves for some U bar, uh, maximizing the expected discounted payoff for one party, subject to holding the other party's expected discounted payoff uh, greater than U bar. Um, and what's the result here? The result here is that the efficient level of the public good is theta H plus theta F. So it's, I, I want to sort of highlight this. Uh, we're not talking about uh, a unidimensional policy where we have parties on either end and the efficient level is in the middle. Uh, this is a, a, a situation where the party is actually the sum of the weights that these, uh, sorry, the efficient level is the sum of the weights that the parties place on the public good. So it's theta H plus theta L. So here's our second benchmark. Uh, what would a dictator do in this setting? Uh, a dictator would simply give the other parties zero transfers and maximize the, uh, uh, his payoff, which is then 1 minus GT plus theta I log GT, and the solution would have uh, GT equal to theta I. So any dictator would simply set the level of the public good below the efficient level and equal to his weight on the public good, theta I. So those are two benchmarks. Now we want to analyze the political problem. Uh, so in our political system, P is the probability that party I is selected as proposer in period T plus one. So the probability of being selected as proposer is Markovian. Right? Depends on the previous period proposal. Uh, so then P captures the persistence of political power. Uh, we'll call ZT the proposal in period T. Uh, we're going to have agreement by unanimity rule. Uh, of course, it would be nice to start thinking about other uh, rules, but for now, this is what we have. Um, <clears throat> in the event of no agreement, the status quo is implemented. And it's the status quo that is uh, sort of the, the focus of the study. What is the status quo? Uh, so this is going to be determined by the rules uh, regarding mandatory and discretionary programs. Um, We'll call ST uh, the status quo in period T, and it's going to be drawn from some feasible set, cap S. Uh, 
call this again? Zeta? I keep forgetting what this is called. So Zeta is going to be our status quo rule, and Zeta takes the budget decided in period uh, T and determines the status quo for period T plus one. So the question is, what is this Zeta function? Um, there are lots of Zeta functions we could consider, but in this paper, we're going to consider two particular Zeta functions. Uh, the Zeta function that returns zero for all budgets, and this is what we call the discretionary spending programs. Uh, also, we'll call, we will focus on the Zeta, uh, which returns uh, G for the public good and zero for the transfers, and this is what we'll call mandatory public good spending. So with mandatory public good spending, you write a program into law, this is like Social Security or Medicare, uh, and unless there is uh, an agreement on a new program, the previous period's program stays in place, so that's G. Versus transfers, uh, transfers in under this specification uh, revert to zero under the status quo. Is it clear? So we're going to look at um, Markov perfect equilibria, um, and I won't get. I'll probably go through this really quickly. Um, so essentially, uh, each each uh, party will have a strategy consisting of two components. One is a proposal strategy, which is given by pi i, and one is an acceptance strategy, given by alpha i. The proposal strategy needs to state for any status quo, uh, what, is the, uh, what is the public good spending for the period, what is the transfer to party h, and what is the transfer to party f. Uh, an acceptance strategy must say for a status quo and a given proposal whether or not the uh, proposal is accepted, uh, which is one, or rejected, which is zero. We're going to restrict attention, which is not really a, a serious restriction, to uh, proposals which are accepted in equilibrium right away. Uh, so then alpha is always one for the proposal on the table. Uh, and I'm sorry, so that's point two. And point one is when parties are indifferent, they accept the proposal on the table. Uh, we'll see that indifference rules matter a little bit when uh, Dave presents our paper, but for this paper, it's, uh, it's less important. So the dynamic payoff uh, is going to be given by V for the party that's the proposer and W for the party that's the responder. And we're going to define our equilibrium as follows. It will satisfy three conditions. Uh, the first condition, which we call E1, is that parties accept, if and only if, their dynamic payoff is greater than the status quo payoff. So throughout the paper, we'll denote capital KI as the status quo payoff for party I when the state is S. The second equilibrium condition is, of course, that the proposal must maximize the party's uh, dynamic payoff subject to ensuring the out-of-power party is kept at least indifferent. So the dynamic payoff of the out-of-power party must be at least as great as his status quo payoff. And the third equilibrium condition is simply that the equilibrium payoffs must be consistent with equilibrium strategies. So now let's uh, think about the result on discretionary spending. Uh, so the result on discretionary spending is quite straightforward. So if uh, we have that all this spending is discretionary, so our zeta function is zero for all of B, uh, then the public good will always be provided at the dictator level. And uh, here it's sort of, uh, we can see if, if the, uh, if, sorry, if G is zero, then the status quo payoff is in fact negative infinity, so you can always satisfy the, uh, the constraint of the out of power party. Right? And this doesn't really depend too much on the log specification. The idea is that if the, if, uh, the status quo is zero for the out of power party, he gets a very low payoff, so you can always satisfy him with, with almost any level of the public good. So the party in power simply sets the level of public good that he wants in equilibrium, and the dictator level is implemented. 
So in that sense, we can see that discretionary spending gives us a lower uh, a level of uh, public good spending, which is lower than the efficient level of public good spending. And what about mandatory public spending? So this is where the analysis is a little more complicated. Um, so now uh, we focus on the status quo rule, the zeta function, where uh, it's G, and G is the, la the previous period's allocation of the public good, and zero for transfers. So now we can think of the state variable as summarized by G, the previous period, pe previous period level of the public good. Uh, so to get a little bit of intuition, we're going to first do a, a one period problem. So imagine that uh, this is uh, simply one period, and the part there's an exogenous status quo level of the public good G, and party I is simply going to maximize its payoff subject to keeping the out of power party, party J, uh, just indifferent. KJ is still the status quo payoff, but here KJ is much simpler. It's simply theta J log G. So with the one period problem, the characterization is, is somewhat easy. Um, the strategy for the public good for party I is to set a fixed level, which is theta I, party I's ideal level of the public good, uh, for any level of the, the status quo public good below theta I. For any level of the public good between theta i and theta h plus theta l, party i sets the level of the public good at g. Uh, and for any level above the efficient level, theta h plus theta l, party i sets the level of the public good at theta h plus theta l, the efficient level. So I'm going to show you in a picture what that looks like. So this is the solution for the one period problem for um, public good provision. So the red line is party L's strategy, the uh, blue line is party H's strategy. Party L, as I said, uh, for all status quo levels of the public good, good below theta L, sets pa uh, party L's ideal level, theta L. Uh, for all, all levels between theta L and theta H plus theta L, party L sets exactly the status quo level of the public good because that keeps party uh, H just indifferent. And for all levels above theta H plus theta L, party L sets uh, the efficient level of the public good, theta H plus theta L. So what's missing from this picture is transfers, what's going on with transfers. So it's important to note that for all levels of the public good above theta H plus theta L, both party L and party H are getting transfers. Uh, for uh, levels of the uh, public good below theta H plus theta L, the out of, power part, out of power party is not getting any transfers. So now let's talk about the infinite horizon problem. So uh, this is a much more complicated problem, um, uh, but we, we can use the one period solution to start guessing at what the solution might look like in the infinite horizon problem, and really the solution concept is guess and verify. Um, uh, so we're going to assume that for some range of values of the status quo, the responder's acceptance constraint does not bind. So this is the case in the region below here. So this is the region in which the responder's acceptance constraint does not bind. So the, the power, party power can set the uh, his ideal level of the public good. So we're going to assume that some region like that also exists in the dynamic case. Uh, and we're going to ask the question, uh, would parties have some incentive to insure themselves in a way uh, with the public good? So now recall that once you, it, with a mandatory program, when you put, uh, put the allocation in the public good, you know that in the event you're out of power next period, that public good is still there. So you get that status quo payoff. So do parties now have an incentive to raise the level of the public good above uh, what they might have done in the static problem in order to insure themselves? And the answer is yes, for some parameter values uh, and for the, uh, actually I'll stop there, for some parameter values. Uh, but polarization matters. Um, and polarization in this model, we're going to define as uh, theta h over theta l, so theta h, 
just the value that party H places on the public good, um, and theta L is the value that party L places on the public good. So the ratio is the level of polarization in this model. And what we're going to find is that when uh, polarization is low, we don't get over-provision due to this insurance effect. But when polarization is high, we can get over-provision of the public good due to this insurance effect. And one question is, what happens in the steady state? Um, and how does public good provision compare to discretionary? These are the questions we're going to ask in the dynamic model. In the dynamic model, what we get is that when polarization is sufficiently low, there's an equilibrium such that uh, the equilibrium level of the public good is higher than with discretionary spending. And the set of steady states is in this interval, um, let's call this uh, value theta h star. Um, this value is in fact higher than theta h, the level, the ideal level of the public good for party h. Uh, and so in the interval of theta h star and theta h plus theta l, um, these are all the steady states in the infinite horizon model. So what that tells us is that in the infinite horizon model, we get a higher uh, provision of public good uh, in expected terms than in the uh, static model. Um, so I won't go through the equilibrium characterization, but I'll skip to the pictures. And you might wonder why this picture is so bumpy right here. Um, it's bumpy because we generate these pictures through value function iteration, which is another kind of what I think is a cool thing about this model, um, that we can't apply standard dynamic programming um, theories, but as it turns out, value function iteration gets us to the solution. Um, and I should point out that we do the characterization, it's a complete theoretical characterization separate from the value function iteration, it just so happens the two coincide, which is a nice feature. Uh, this is an example of what the output looks like for low polarization. In this case, uh, 0.15 is theta L, so that's party L's ideal level of the public good in the static case. Party H's ideal level of the public good is 0.2, and what we see here is that the, the level that party H sets when party H is unconstrained is strictly above 0.2. So this is that theta H star value that I was talking about before. So in the infinite horizon case for these parameter values, all of the steady states lie in this range. So the efficient level of the public good is a steady state, but not the only steady state in this, in this example. So before we do the high polarization case, um, we can do some comparative statics. Since the, the uh, steady states are in this intermediate range, and we know the lower bound is given by this value, uh, which uh, now it's called g star h, just to confuse you further. Um, but let's call it g star h. Uh, so it's 1 plus delta minus 2 delta p over 1 minus delta p theta h. So clearly this g star h, the lower value of the steady states, depends on the discount factor and it depends on the persistence of power p. So we can do comparative statics on this set of steady states, given that this is the lower bound of the steady states. And what we know is that in the, in the low polarization case, uh, the lowest steady state is increasing in the persistence of power and it's decreasing in the discount factor. So as parties uh, are more confident that they will remain in power, right, they have uh, a stronger incentive to ensure. So I think something here is a little bit backwards. So the intuition is correct. Low persistence of power and higher patience means a stronger incentive to ensure against power fluctuations, which means a higher level of this G star H. So higher levels of the public good uh, in steady states. Um, we can also ask in, in the low polarization case if uh, these mandatory programs improve parties' welfare. And the answer is yes, if uh, parties are sufficiently patient and uh, the persistence of power is sufficiently low. Uh, so that's what this proposition states. Uh, <clears throat> in the low polarization case, party H is better off under mandatory programs. 
Um, and furthermore, party L is also better off when discount factors are sufficiently high and persistence of power is sufficiently low. And again, what's the intuition here? When discount factors are sufficiently high, then, these, then the, the uh, low party uh, has a strong incentive to insure through these mandatory programs. And the same is true when persistence of power is sufficiently low. Now, what about the high polarization case? Uh, so again, this is uh, output from value function iteration, but it uh, gives us a nice illustration of what it looks like, what the equilibrium looks like in the high polarization case. And uh, at first glance, this looks very funky and very different from the low polarization case, um, but there are a lot of similarities. So let's first uh, focus on the, uh, the strategies of the low party, party L. Uh, so for the low party, uh, the low party strategies look exactly as they did before. So uh, point two is theta L, and as before, for low values of the public good, party L sets uh, the level of the public good exactly at his ideal. For intermediate values between the party L's uh, static ideal and uh, the high, uh, sorry, the efficient level of the public good, party L sets the level of the public good exactly at the status quo. And for high levels of the public good, uh, party L sets the efficient level. So of course what's strange, or what looks strange, is the uh, strategies of the high party. And uh, what's going on with the high party strategies? Uh, as it turns out, the strategies are somewhat similar to what we saw before. So the level that's set here for, ver for lower values of the public good, the status quo level of the public good, is exactly the same G star H we saw before. So this is party H's dynamic ideal. This is the level of the public good party H sets in anticipation of the fact that he may be out of power in the future. Party H can set his dynamic ideal for very low values of the public good, but he can also set his dynamic ideal for very high values of the public good. And the reason is, since we're in the high polarization case, when the status quo level of the public good is very high, the low uh, party, in fact, has a very low dynamic payoff. So the low party's dynamic payoff up here is very low, meaning that the low party's uh, responders constraint doesn't bind for very high levels of the public good. So party H gets to set his dynamic ideal at very high levels uh, and very low levels, uh, but in this case, the unique steady state is in fact the efficient level of the public good. And that's the important thing to note here. So the other thing that's uh, interesting about this picture is that we do get over provision of the public good. So in the high polarization case, uh, when party H is setting his dynamic ideal, the definition of the high polarization case is in fact that party H's dynamic ideal is above the efficient level of the public good. So this condition here, that theta H over theta L, strictly bigger than one minus delta P over delta one minus P, is exactly the condition that tells us that this uh, level of the public good, party H's dynamic ideal, or G star H, is above uh, theta H plus theta L. So, so now we can uh, talk about the equilibrium in the high polarization case. Uh, so we have an equilibrium where, well this is kind of everything I just said, uh, equilibrium levels of the public good are higher than discretionary public good spending. So this is for all status quos, whether we're in steady state or not, all equilibrium levels of the public good are higher than with discretionary spending. Uh, there's over provision of the public good, uh, <coughs> spe uh, specifically if the status quo is sufficiently low or sufficiently high, then uh, party H can uh, set the level of the public good strictly above the efficient level, uh, but the unique steady state is the efficient level, theta H plus theta L. Okay, uh, so one question that did not come up, um, and um, was, I was almost asked, I thought, by Andrea, uh, was what happens to other status quo rules? Have we stacked the model uh, so that it favors mandatory spending programs uh, by making only the public good mandatory and not the transfers mandatory? 
And uh, the answer is we have not uh, stacked the model in favor of mandatory programs. And one way to check this is to look at the case where uh, we have all mandatory programs, uh, sorry, all uh, spending, both private and public, as mandatory. So let's look at the zeta function where it's now g x h x l for all budgets. In this case, the payoff relevant state, the status quo, is the entire uh, vector g x h x l. So now we've got a three-dimensional state variable. Um, it's slightly more difficult problems, but we can still do some characterizations here. Um, and we can tell you that in the case of uh, all the spending mandatory, any allocation that's a steady state uh, is, a st is uh, sorry, any allocation is a steady state. If and only if it's a static Pareto efficient allocation, and in addition, every static Pareto efficient allocation is a dynamic Pareto efficient allocation, which means that every steady state in the case of all mandatory is dynamically Pareto efficient. So in that sense, provision of the public good is still improved relative to the case of discretionary spending. So we can also do value function iterations here. Now there's even more bumps because trying to uh, do value function iterations with a three-dimensional state variable is a little computationally intensive. Uh, but we can produce the following picture that looks very similar to the uh, picture with only public good spending mandatory. Uh, and what we have is, again, the efficient level of the public good is set here. So here, theta L is 0.2, theta H is 0.4. Um, and we see that for low levels of the public good, uh, the uh, equilibrium level of the public good is increasing. So here, the unique steady state is the efficient level. Oh, uh, if we start with transfer zero. Um, so we think of this paper as a first step in thinking about mandatory spending programs uh, and their implications for the efficient provision of public goods. Uh, what we find is that with these mandatory programs, public spending on public, uh, so spending on public goods is higher than with only discretionary programs. Uh, we find that we get over provision uh, of public goods uh, if polarization is too high, but this is only transitory. If polarization is very high, we in fact get the unique steady state to be the efficient level of public goods. Um, uh, in, and in what we find is that when uh, parties are sufficiently patient and polarization is low, uh, is, uh, sorry, parties are sufficiently patient, polarization is low and persistence of power is uh, sufficiently uh, high, management programs can also result in uh, Pareto improvement. 